بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وعظيمنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه الغر الميامين الحمد لله الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية سيدي ومولاي علي بن أبي طالب الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله أما بعد فإن كنت بالشورى ملكت أمورهم فكيف هذا والمشيرون غيبوا وإن كنت بالقربى حججت خصيمهم فغيرك أولى بالنبي وأقرب Saqifah is one of the most tragic moments in the history of the religion of Islam although one may argue well executed by Abu Bakr and Umar Indeed you find that the incident of Saqifah is an incident whose repercussions continue to affect the Muslim community all the way until Karbala because the aim of our discussions is to look at the events who from them one could see that there was an effect on the mindset in the lead up to the martyrdom of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. When one looks at Saqifah in the eyes of many Muslims, Saqifah is where Abu Bakr was appointed as the first Khalifa. If you ask millions of Muslims around the world today, how was Abu Bakr appointed? You'll find a couple of different answers. One group actually believe that the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, was the one who told the whole community that after me, the Khalifa will be Abu Bakr. But you'll find that the majority, on the other hand, say that when the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, passed away, he left it for the Muslim community to choose. And the Muslim community, all of them gathered together, and when they all gathered together, they decided in their thousands, in the election known as the election of Saqif at Bani Sa'ada, that this man is the greatest man after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alih, that this man is the man that we should all follow, that there is nobody who is like this man, and that the likes of Umar and others straight away pledged their allegiance to him, and that all the companions were in unison and unanimously agreed on the Khilafah of Abu Bakr. This is the opinion of the majority of the Muslims in the world today. However, when one scrutinizes what exactly took place, then it's unbelievable what a mess Islam, according to this particular incident, was in. Because if you were to go into depth as to what took place at Saqifah, Shortly after the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, died, those who were meant to be his helpers from the Ansar and those who had migrated with him, known as the Muhajirun, were in skirmishes with one another, were fighting one another, were shouting at one another. As in honestly, a non-Muslim, if they were to look at what happened at Saqifa, they would turn around to each and every one of us and say, it looks like your Prophet didn't do the best job in the world because there seems to be a mess not only in terms of authority after he dies, but also in terms of conduct. Okay, put authority aside. Why is it that these grown men are suddenly fighting each other while the man himself is being buried? At the very least, even a person who has never come near revelation in their life would straight away turn around and say that at a funeral or near a funeral or when a big figure passes away, there is a certain amount of conduct, etiquette to be expected. Even if you weren't very close to the person, people would expect you to honor that person in a certain way. Others reply back to this by saying that the important issue of leadership had to be solved. The irony of such a statement, of course, 
is that the companions knew the issue of leadership needed to be solved, but the man who bought the religion himself didn't know. The companions knew that it was important for them to appoint a leader from amongst them, whereas the man who came to guide not just Islam, Muslims, Arabs, not the whole of mankind, left the world without appointing a leader. Therefore, when people ask me, what's the difference between Shia and Sunni? Common question, which everybody asks. The main difference rests on this issue. A man like the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family, does he leave the world in a mess in the hands of those who 23 years earlier were burying their daughters alive and were worshipping that which is made out of wood and that which is made out of stone? Or does he make it clear before he dies that this is the best of men to guide you after me? Pretty simple issue. A man who wouldn't leave his house without appointing a leader, wouldn't leave Medina without appointing a governor, wouldn't leave Mecca without ensuring someone was there. How could the same man be a man who leaves this world without leaving a leader? But further than that, and what's scarier than that, as in our last two nights, we've seen Umar ibn al-Khattab's blatant attack on the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family, when he asked for a pen and paper. And Umar ibn al-Khattab's stand in saying, the Quran is sufficient for us. And then after that, Abu Bakr and Umar refusing to be under the leadership of Osama. It means that in the last week of the life of the Holy Prophet, the two most famous personalities one may argue not just in the non-shi'i world one may argue even in the muslim world were themselves openly rejecting if not standing against the wishes of the prophet if they could do that while he was alive what would stop them doing that after he's died therefore when we look at this issue this is not an issue for us to cause sectarianism between each other because there are some people whenever they look at an issue about early islamic history you'll find them straight away saying but why is it that we raise these issues why don't we bring unity between the ummah of rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi? why is it that we cannot come together as muslims if that's the case then we should scrap all our discussions of history in all honesty at the end of the day the quran as the book tells me to study prophets who came thousands of years before the Holy Prophet. Someone might say, what happened at Saqifa was a thousand years ago. How does that affect me today? Well, what happened to Adam and Eve was thousands of years before the prophets had revealed the Quran. So why were we discussing Adam and Eve's creation then? We should have just discussed contemporary Mecca and contemporary Medina. The aim of these discussions is as the Quran says, Qad khalat min qablikum sunan. They came before you trends in history. So study them, travel on the earth, look at what's happened, look at what's happened to those who came before you. Therefore, when we examine Saqifa, our aim is to understand the difference between those who held on to the one appointed by Allah and announced by the Prophet and those who decided to take things into their own hands from the moment the Prophet asked for a pen and paper until Saqifa and the way they went about it. Let's tonight examine in depth what took place in this incident known as Saqifah. And I'd like to do this in the following stages. Number one, did the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, give Imam Ali any hints that this is what they're going to do? He has given everyone else knowledge of the future. Why wouldn't he give it to Imam Ali, alayhi salam? Number two, when the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, died, who is the one who led his funeral prayer? Who's the one who buried him? Who was the one to have him in his lap when he died? Number three, what made Abu Bakr leave the house of the Prophet when the Prophet had died? What triggered Umar to tell him quickly leave? Something's happening. Now four, if Imam Ali was chosen at Ghadir, then why are the Ansar holding an election for a leader amongst themselves? Why would they go against what the Prophet has already said? Number five, Abu Bakr gives a famous speech about why the Muhajirun have a greater claim to be leaders than the Ansar. But why doesn't he quote any hadith about him being the leader of the Muslims? Surely that would have been a lot stronger for him. Number six, did everyone come and pledge allegiance to him? Or were there companions who said no chance? And if they said no chance, can they be counted as Fasiq? And if they're counted as Fasiq, 
What does that say about all the great رضي الله عنهم around Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وآله Further than that, where was Imam Ali alayhi salam? If his leadership was taken, then where's the power of Khaybar and Khandaq at this moment? And how does Imam Ali alayhi salam highlight in Nahj al balagha the pain that he faced in seeing what took place? Number eight, how does Sahih Muslim highlight Imam Ali's opinion of Abu Bakr? And how does Umar say that, O oh, Ali, the following four is what you believe Abu Bakr is? And therefore, is that a Shia opinion or does it originate with Ali before his own Shia? And finally, if Abu Bakr could be a leader at Saqifah because of a number of friends who elect him, what stops others coming one day and saying, what's wrong with my dad choosing me if others could choose for themselves? And how does Yazid use this to his advantage in not only becoming Khalifa, but appointing whoever he pleases the way they appointed at Saqifa. Let's examine this and dissect the topic in depth. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa had a certain amount of knowledge of the unseen. He knows about certain events that will happen in history. He warns certain people about things that will happen in the future. Did he warn Imam Ali alayhi salam about all this? Because this is a question that has to be asked. Did he warn Imam Ali that there'll be a day where there'll be a group of people who'll come, who'll come and take his leadership away from him, who will come in a certain place while he's next to the Prophet? Of course, he warned him. In one hadith, he says to him, while Imam Ali sees him crying, he says to him, Ya Rasulullah, what is it that makes you cry? He says that they have a hate for you hidden. After I die, all of it will come out. Imagine. That there was already a hiqid against Imam Ali alayhi salam that causes the Prophet to cry. Sometimes in our mosques you hear people saying, we should just go to lectures, listen to the lecture and go home. There's no need to cry, cry. All these guys do in Muharram is cry. In Safar all they do is cry. My Prophet cried about Masaib that hadn't even occurred. Before Imam Ali alayhi salam had gone through his musibah, he asks the Prophet, and the Prophet says, because they've got hate against you inside. When we saw that hate, for what reason? On the one hand, there's the hate of him killing their fathers, whether we like it or we don't. If you've killed this person's dad at Badr, and his uncle at Uhud, and his cousin at Khaybar, and his cousin at Khandar, and his cousin... One day, those guys are going to come back with a certain amount of venom, even if they've converted to the religion of Islam, there's still going to be a certain amount of animosity within them where they're going to be like, you know what, not always you. Number two, the fact that he got Fatima and everybody else got a blatant rejection. That hurts. I've come to propose for Fatima and you're saying no, 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 and only Ali is the one who gets Fatima. Ali is to me like Aaron was to Moses. Which companion was compared to a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Ali is the nafs of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa on the day of Mubahala. But more importantly, where? When Surah 9 was being revealed, the only Surah which does not have Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. When it was being revealed, the Prophet sent Abu Bakr towards the Quraysh so that he reveals the Surah to them. When Abu Bakr was on the way, Jibra'il comes to the Prophet and says, only you or someone from you can reveal this to them. The Prophet at this moment sends Imam Ali alayhi salam. Abu Bakr, when he had gone towards the Quraysh, of course found this as an honor that I'm the one who tells them about Surat Tawbah or Surat Bara'at. Who was with Abu Bakr? Umar ibn Khattab was with him. Abu Ubaid ibn Jarrah was with him. Salim, the Mawla of Abu Hudayfa was with him. The same big names that come at Saqifa are all heading towards the Quraysh. The Prophet, either you tell them about Surat Tawbah or someone from you. The Prophet sends Imam Ali alayhi salam. Imam Ali stops them on the way and says, I have to take it. Which by the way, in our narrations, what do we find? That some of them say, don't give it to Ali. But Abu Bakr says, okay, yeah, you go ahead. From there, there was already a hate. There was already a problem with Imam Ali alayhi salam taking this accolade. How many accolades Imam Ali has? One after the other. There was a certain amount of envy that existed between these personalities, let alone Khalid ibn al-Walid and others. You know, our non-Shia brothers, what do they say? They say, Man kuntu mawla, Ali mawla, because Khalid and Imam Ali had an issue with each other. 
Boreida and Imam Ali had an issue with each other. I don't care whether I believe you or I don't believe you. There's a central point for me. What is the central point? That the companions already had a hate for Ali ibn Abi Talib. If you could have a hate for Ali while Rasulullah is alive, God save Amir al muminin after Rasulullah dies. While Rasulullah is alive, there is already a great amount of jealousy, envy towards Amir al muminin then let alone after Rasulullah dies, especially Rasul dies in his lap, even though this accolade, they wanted to give it to Aisha, that she says he was on my lap when he passed away. On the contrary, Imam Ali and Nahj al number one says that the Prophet was on my lap. Others such as wives of the Prophet, companions of the Prophet say he was on the lap of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. He died. Who is the one who executed the will of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi? Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. Who is the one who buried uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Because you know, Medina had two grave diggers. Abu Ubaid ibn Jarrah was one. Abu Talha was the second. Abu Talha was the only one available on that day. Imam Ali made sure he saw the lowering of the uh, janaz of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. He saw that everything went smoothly. Imam Ali alayhi salam was the one who made sure that the Prophet was buried. He was the one who led the funeral prayers of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. There are many who were elder than him. And there are many who said he shouldn't be leader because Imam Ali is too young. Because Imam Ali on that day, how old was he when the Prophet died? 33 years of age. Which, by the way, Islamically is very old. Because when you have a Prophet who can speak from the cradle at 33, you're already quite mature. So what happened was that Imam Ali led the funeral prayers of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. He had alongside him people coming in and out. And I know sometimes in Shi'i circles there's this impression that Abu Bakr and Umar did not attend the funeral of the Prophet. No, they did attend the funeral of the Prophet. To say that they didn't attend when Medina is not some city which is like 85,000 million miles wide. Everything that's happening in Medina is happening in a certain location. As in if you go to Medina... You'll see, for example, Masjid al-Nabawi, and then from Masjid al-Nabawi to Jannat al baqi And that's the whole of the downtown, let's say. And you don't really have to go too far unless you're going towards Uhud and so on and so forth. These people were coming in and out. Imam Ali, in some cases, according to our traditions, he would be leading the prayer. There'd be people in a circle of 10 facing the grave. And they would, for example, follow Imam. Imam would recite, Inna Allah wa malaikta sallun ala nabi and so on and so forth. So everything was done by Imam Ali alayhi salam. Imam Ali alayhi salam made sure that the greatest man on earth got the funeral and the respect that he deserved. Nobody else was asked to lead the funeral prayers of Rasulullah except Amir al muminin alayhi salam. Which I think you'd all agree pretty much puts him in pole position. If we never knew about Ghadir, I didn't know about Ghadir, and I see that this is the man leading Salah, I would say it puts him in pole position. But for us Shia, Ghadir was clear. And for us Shia, the envy because of Ghadir was clear. For us Shia, my prophet, who moves from here till there, he makes sure there's a leader who represents him so that there isn't chaos in society. My prophet on that day in Ghadir made it clear. Man kuntu mawla, fahada ali mawla. Allahumma wali man wala, wa adi man ada. Oh Allah, be a guardian to whoever takes him as a guardian. But be an enemy to whoever takes him as an enemy. Huge line. Because if everybody loves him, then there's no need for that line. It's very interesting that the word Mawla, if it applies to Ali, it means friend. But if it applies to Abu Bakr, it means Khalifa. Wali, if it's Abu Bakr, it's Khalifa, leader. Ali, if it's Wali, means friend only. Notice that in Hadith literature. So anyway, so what happens is that Imam Ali looks after everything. Imam Ali knows that I'm already Imam. I'm already the one who is chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Abu Bakr is in the house of the Prophet. Remember, Abu Bakr is the father-in-law of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa At the end of the day, Aisha, his daughter, is married to the Prophet and has a claim of inheritance. One-eighth goes to the widow in Islamic law. Unless, of course... You share it with the other nine, then you get one out of 72 and you're on a major headache. But let's say one eighth goes towards the widow. Aisha is there. What then happens? What's taking place? Omar comes to the Prophet. Now, one of the best references I've read in explaining Saqifah is Al-Kamil fi tarikh okay, of Ibn Al-Athir. Try and get hold of it and read what happens at Saqifah. What happens is that Umar comes and sends a message to Abu Bakr, quickly come. Abu Bakr is like, but I'm here. He says, quickly come. The Ansar who have gathered, the people of Medina, have gathered where? 
at the Saqifa of Bani Sa'id, like a portico of Bani Sa'id, who are of the Khazraj, a place they used to gather. They've all gathered there and they've decided amongst them for a leader by the name of Sa'ad bin Ubadah that the Ansar are unanimous that this leader is there. Abu Bakr doesn't flinch. Straight away with Umar, with Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah, straight away they all head to Saqifah. Salman, no. Ammar bin Yas, no. Miqdad, no. Jabir bin Abdullah Ansar, no. Hudayf al yaman no. Nobody's going to Saqifah except these. You've got the Ansar, and you've got this trio of Muhajirun. I can name you another few of the Muhajirun. They've all headed where? They've all headed towards the Saqifa. When they've gone to the Saqifa, the Ansar are choosing leader amongst them. Question, if Imam Ali is chosen at Ghadir, why the Ansar choosing a leader amongst themselves? Huh. Firstly, the Ansar, on the one hand, they can choose a leader for them in their area. If Imam Ali becomes Imam of the whole community, why can't I have a mayor for my area, for example? Or a local councillor. Secondly, maybe the Ansar knew these guys who when a man tells them, give me a pen and paper, say you're delirious. You think they're going to let Ali ibn Abi Talib become a leader? Let's get our leadership in quickly. They're not even going to look after Ali. We should look after ourselves from now. We should have our own leader. A few days earlier, the Prophet tells them, go with Osama. And they say, you make us go under an 18-year-old. How are they going to let this 33-year-old become their leader? Let's take a leader from amongst ourselves. Did all of them therefore reject Imam Ali? No, no. If you read the hadiths, you'll find that they speak out for Imam Ali. Why? When they get there, the Ansar said that we have a leader who we have chosen Sa'ad bin Ubadah. By the way, this Sa'ad bin Ubadah is counted as one of the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Never ever in his life gave bay'ah to Abu Bakr or Umar. Never. Never. On that day in Saqifah, he said, I will not give him bay'ah. Question, if he doesn't give bay'ah to someone chosen by the Prophet or by Allah, then he must be a fasiq. But if he's a fasiq, that means you have a companion of the Prophet who's counted as a fasiq. But all the companions cannot be counted as Ahlul Fusul. So what do we do? Sa'ad bin Ubadah was chosen to be what? Was chosen to be the leader of the Ansar. And the Ansar had a particular policy. What did they say? An Amir from us and an Amir from you. Okay, no problem. You want, you've come here in this gathering. Why don't we have an Amir from ourselves and you have an Amir from you, a leader from yourselves and a leader from us? Abu Bakr then be begins his speech at Saqifa. And when he begins his speech, he begins by mentioning why the Muhajirun have a greater right to be leaders than the Ansar. In this whole sermon, realize one thing. Never once does he say that I am the man appointed by Rasulullah. <coughs> if he once said it, that I am the one chosen on the day of Ghadir. I am the one chosen on the day of Mubahala. I am the one chosen on the day of the Mu'akhat. I am the one. If he says it once, he would be in pole position because then it's a problem for someone if the Prophet has chosen you and you go against him. Do you agree? Imam Ali on a number of times, and I've referenced this in my majalis throughout. Many of you can access it on our page on YouTube. Many times I've looked at this. Where Imam Ali السلام, clearly says, was I not the one appointed at Ghadir? You know where I always bring this example? If Aisha was one of the ladies where the verse of Tathir was revealed, why doesn't she use the verse against Imam Ali at the day of Jamal? She say, I'm one of the people who was purified. Ahl al-Bayt. Imam Abu Bakr, what does he do? Abu Bakr, on that speech, listen to the wording, never once says, I was appointed by the Prophet. Never once. His followers today will make the biggest clamor that he's appointed by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. If he was, then I'm in a problem. Because if the Prophet raised his hand and said, Man kuntu mawla fahada, Abu Bakr Mawla, if he said that, then I can't do anything. And then they, I'm going to have to follow him. Yes. Although I would probably have to use their excuse of friend and just say it's just friendship what it means. But Abu Bakr, what does he do? He says in the name of God and then he begins to praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And then he says, oh people, the Arabs were people who were in a state of jahiliyyah. They were worshipping that which was made out of wood and that which was made out of stone. And Allah sent them the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, his family. And the Holy Prophet was a witness of Allah's truth. And the Holy Prophet, he went through trials and tribulations and Allah chose us. The muhajirun is the ones who look after this prophet and stand with him through every trial and we stood with him in every tribulation and we are the closest to him and we are the ones who believed in him when others did not believe in him. We were the ones chosen to be there in all his times of difficulty. Opposing us is oppression. You the Ansar are good people and you are the ones who welcomed the prophet peace be upon him and his family when he came to Medina. For that you should deserve your respect but we deserve more respect because we are closer to the prophet peace be upon him and his family and we went through all the trials and the pain and the tribulations and the battles with the holy prophet peace be upon him and his family he says all of this Habab ibn Mundir turned around to the Ansar he says hold your guns don't listen to him hold on say to him an Amir from you and an Amir from us why should we take what he says? We stick to a leader from ourselves, which shows in the Muslim community the idea of Abu Bakr being as great as he is made out to be amongst the Ansar. They look at him and they're like, why should we follow what you're saying? Who are you for us to follow what you're saying? For what reason? If you have an accolade in Islamic history, what would it be? Either he's the father-in-law of the Prophet. Or he was with the Prophet in the cave according to hadith. And thank God for hadith. If we stick to Umar's words, the Quran's enough for us, then Abu Bakr has no praise. But hadith puts him into the Quran and the verse of the cave. Why should we follow you? Habab bin Mundir said, why? Hold your guns, hold your horses. Stay here. We choose Sa'ad bin Ubadah. We're not going to go with him. Abu Bakr turned around and said, listen, the Umara are from us. And the Wuzara are from you. Leaders from the Muhajirun. And the Wuzara, what shall we say Wuzara can be in English? The representative. For example, someone who gets a particular position. We say that those people are what? Those will be from the Ansar. Why? Omar then steps in. Omar says the reason that Abu Bakr has to be the leader. And you know what? Wallah, we would have been saved with all this headache had we just stuck to the man at Ghadir. This whole headache, who should be leader? So why do you think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala appointed Imam Ali al Ghadir? Because he knew if you leave it for mankind to choose from amongst each other, you choose not who's best, who suits you. Our mosques now in the Muslim world, is it who's best fit to lead or who suits my interest and my opinions? The one who's best fit to lead because he might be too just, we won't choose him. Choose the one who's an old family friend, old link, not because I think he's better than anyone. True? So therefore, when we look at this, it would have been all saved at Ghadir. Ghadir, the Prophet said, listen, Ali bin Abi Talib, I am the city of knowledge, this man's the gate. It's as simple as that. What's a Khalifa? God's rep on earth who has more knowledge than everybody and the people therefore have to obey him and follow him. So then Omar says, you must follow him. Why? Because they will never accept that the leader after the Prophet is someone who is not from the tribe of the Prophet. He has to be from the tribe of the Prophet. I don't know if you're noticing something in this whole sermon. Every point that they mention literally ticks one man. But instead of giving it to that man as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did, it was like, well, why is it not us? The people will not accept. You go to Ansar, Ansar who? Khazraj, Aws, they're not the same as us who are related to the Bani Hashim. So why not go for Bani Hashim themselves? Omar then noticing that there's, you know what happens? Suddenly disagreement and shouting. I swear if non-Muslims read what happened, Saqifah, they'll be like, my God. Muhammad certainly left a mess behind. His people don't know, do we choose him? Do we choose him? And the man's still being buried and there's still people visiting his, his grave. And here we have at Saqif at Bani Sa'ada, a major ruckus taking place. Why did they rush to choose a leader? Because the Muslim Ummah cannot be left without a leader. Abu Bakr and Umar know this and my Prophet doesn't.
You're telling me that the ummah is in need of a leader and therefore we had to leave the janazah and everything to make sure a leader is appointed. You knew this and the man who used to receive emails from heaven doesn't. Omar grabs Abu Bakr al and says, pledge allegiance, I pledged, that's it. He's become leader. If that's the way we choose leaders in Islam, what? Yani how do I tell non-Muslims that, by the way, this is how we choose a leader. He says something, he says something, they have a little fight. This one says, I'm not sure. And above all else is what? Where's the electorate? People always say to me that there's thousands of companions of the prophets and we must love all of them. No problem. Okay, where are they? How were the uh, ballot votes that day? Voter turnout, what do you think? What's voter turnout that day? Because some big names not there. Some big names are not there. And that was Imam Ali alayhi salam's first point to them. In the poetry that I quoted at the beginning of the lecture. Imam Ali alayhi salam looked at what they had done. Because the news reached Imam Ali alayhi salam. Because the news went around town. Abu Bakr has been chosen as Khalifa. Umar ibn al-Khattab and Abu Ubaidah jarrah and Abdul Rahman bin Awf and whoever and whoever have pledged their allegiance. Khalid ibn, ibn Sa'id ibn al-As didn't pledge allegiance. What's his status if he rejects Abu Bakr? Is he Muslim or no? If Abu Bakr is appointed by the Prophet or by God and this man rejects him, then you have to call him a Fasiq. And if he is a Fasiq, then your companions can't all be going heaven. But if this man rejects Abu Bakr and you say that he is a Muslim and can still go to heaven, what's your problem with the Shia when they reject Abu Bakr? Shi'i theology, we reject Abu Bakr as Khalifa. This is well known. There's no need to hide such a thing. Is it? This is our narrative and other schools in Islam have their narrative. There's no problem. Everybody has their narrative. When I reject him, why you call me Rafadi proudly? When Salman and Abu Dhar reject him, call them Rawafid. When Khalid ibn Sa'id rejects him, call him a Rafadi. When Sa'ad ibn Ubadah rejects him, call him a Rafadi. Call them Rawafid. Go on, call the companions of the Prophet Rawafid. But you don't. You don't. Is it a crime if they rejected Abu Bakr? If it is, that means you've got Imama, not just us. You say that we made up a thing called Imama and that our Imams are Masoom and so on. Hold on, if someone rejects Abu Bakr's Khalifa, you said that us people are kuffar, if not munafiqoon. Let's say they don't do takfir, but they say that we are Rawafid and so on and so forth. At Saqifa, Imam Ali in his poetry, what does he say? فَإِن كُنْتَ بِالشُّورَ مَلَكْتَ أُمُورَهُمْ If it is in consultation and shura that you decided their affairs, فَكَيْفَ هَذَا وَالْمُشِيرُونَ غُيَّبُوا How is that? When the electorate are not present in that shura. If it, we decided we're going to have an election, at least let them be present. Because the Ansar, what did they shout? Ali ibn Abi Talib is the only leader and we will give bay'ah to him. People started shouting, Imam Ali is our leader. Imam, no. But that time, the Muhajirun, what did they have? They had enough personalities who were able to ensure that their hate of Ali brought in others who hated Ali. Others who envied Ali. Imam Ali says, فَإِن كُنْتَ بِالشُّورَ مَلَكْتَ أُمُورَهُمْ if it is in a shura election that you decide government affairs, how is that the case when the electorate are not even present? Where are they? They're absent. Now listen to this line. And if it is in your nearness to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi that you claim you should be leader, there are others who are much closer in relation to the Prophet than you. Because your whole speech was based on which things? We are the closest to Rasulullah. We are the ones who went through the trials of Rasulullah. Point A, you're the closest. You're not. Your father-in-law, this one's first cousin. There's no way you're closest. 
If it's about Qurba, Ali ibn Abi Talib is closer than you will ever be. If it's about trials with Rasulullah, about trials, those who went through the most pain and anguish with him. In the Shi'ab of Abu Talib, where were you for three years when the Prophet and Khadija saw pain? Where were you? Forget that. And the front lines are better. I never saw you. At Uhud, some of you are amongst the list of those who ran and the Quran revealed verses. At Khandaq, it was you against Amr ibn Wid that day? Or it was Ali versus Amr ibn Wid? At Khaybar, Marhab made a mockery of all of you until Dhul Fiqar taught him a lesson. At Hunayn, you ran and ran and the Holy Prophet's alone. Ali is the one there. Trials! Islam died many times were it not for the sword of Ali ibn Abi Talib. This religion would have died many times. Which trial? Amr ibn Wid al-Amri and you were one-on-one? -on -one? Marhab and you were one-on-one? -on -one? The Prophet at Badr, was it you who went out with Hamza at the beginning? Always at the back. Never at the front. So which trials are you telling the Ansar? That you're saying to them, I should be the leader because we the Muhajir went through trial. Muhajirun went through trial, I'm not denying. Ammar bin Yasser went through crazy trials. He saw his mom Sumayya and his father Yasser killed in front of him. He should be Khalifa. That's a Muhajir. And that's someone who should be Khalifa. The amount of trials that Ammar saw in his life. But nobody saw more trials in their life with the Holy Prophet like Imam Ali. Hamr ibn Wid looks at all of them. You, you're telling me that you believe the man tells you if you die, you go to Jannah. So fight me. If I kill you, you go to his heaven. And if you kill me, you go to his heaven. So why are you all hiding? Islam was made a fool of that day. Until the Prophet said the whole of Iman has come out to fight the whole of Kufr. And Imam Ali came out that day and his one strike was greater than the strike of every human and jinn until the day of judgment. That's trial. Khaybar with an infected eye. One eye of Ali was worth more than your four. All of these lines. And you tell them that you should be the leader. Imam Ali turns around and says, فَإِن كُنْتَ بِالشُّورَ مَلَكْتَ أُمُورَهُمْ فَكَيْفَ هَذَا وَالْمُشِيرُونَ غُيَّبُوا It is in Ashura that you said that you rule government affairs election. Who's there from the election? In the mosque we have elections. There's a good turnout. And you go, Saqifa, what's the turnout? 99% Ansar, a few Muhajirun, and then we tell everybody what's happened. And if it's in your nearness, to the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family. Therefore, who is nearer to the Prophet than I am? And that's why you found that Imam Ali alayhi salam, people say, why did Imam Ali not do anything? No, when the people came to Imam Ali and said this happened, he said, very well. What do you want to do? They said, we should fight these people who have taken your right, the right given to you by the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family. What did Imam Ali reply? He said, very well, then come tomorrow morning with your head shaved. We'll fight. So we'll talk. Let's walk the walk. And the next morning, only four or five turn up from those 300. Amongst them, Salman and Abu Dhar. Shaved heads completely. And Imam Ali said, and the narrations differ. If we had 30, if we had 40, we would have fought. The reality was, there was only a few who remained loyal to Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. They were joined by others as well who became more outspoken. Abu Dhar al-Ghafari gave bay'ah to the first Khalifa? No. Salman was at Saqifah? No. Ammar gave the Salifah? No. Miqdad? No. Where's everybody who's meant to see you? And why don't you use a hadith about the Prophet appointing you? Just one hadith. Just use a hadith and say it to everybody that on that day the Prophet said I was your leader. Because if you had used it, even when Umar became Khalifa and Talha had a problem with Umar becoming Khalifa, appointed by Abu Bakr, which raises another question. How comes Abu Bakr can appoint a Khalifa but Rasulullah cannot? How? You can appoint a leader and Rasulullah cannot appoint a leader. Wallah, I talk to every person out there who has a conscience and has intellect. 
I don't discuss these things so that we just look at a period of history or because we want differences. Open your minds, open your hearts. Further than that, Imam Ali alayhi salam in Nahj al because sometimes people say Imam Ali had no issue. I saw a video today which was amazing. A video where somebody said, and you know, these clips that they send, I've been a victim of myself. You can send a two minute clip and you don't know the context of what's being said. I saw a video where it was like, the person was saying, well, because our people don't know anything about these leaders, that's why they get worried about them. No, no, no. We know quite a bit. That's the problem. Now, I wish ignorance was bliss, but sometimes ignorance is iblis, not bliss. And the person needs to know. The reality is, in Nahj al-Balagha, Sermon 3, Imam Ali alayhi salam said, the son of Abu Quhafa, meaning Abu Bakr, dressed himself with the caliphate. Dressed himself with the caliphate. Meaning he appointed himself. And he knew my relationship to it was like the relationship of the axis in relation to the windmill. And then later in that sermon, and many of you will have heard my majlis on Shakshaqiyya, later in that sermon, Imam Ali alayhi salam talks about, I saw the plundering of my inheritance in front of me. What do I do? Do I remain patient? Or do I attack? There was a pain in the eye and a suffocation in my throat. I had to endure the darkness of tribulations wherein grown men become feeble. And the young grow old. And those who worship Allah under strain until they meet him. All these lines, Imam Ali alayhi salam makes it clear. Even Abu Sufyan told him, listen, I've heard they've taken your leadership. I've got soldiers ready for you. Now, you, Abu Sufyan, you, when you come near leadership, that's the end of the religion of Islam. Abu Sufyan told him, I'll give you what you want. Imam Ali alayhi salam became like what? You know when those ladies came to Nabi Sulaiman with one baby? And one lady said, that's my kid. And the other said, that's my kid. And Nabi Sulaiman said, what? He said, then what I'll do is I'll cut the baby in half. I'll give half to you. One of them said, no, 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 no. It's her kid. And Nabi Sulaiman said, it must be yours. She said, no, I said, it's hers. So no, it must be yours. Because a mother cannot bear to see her child cut in half. Likewise, Imam Ali salam couldn't bear to see this religion cut in half. He knew that Abu Sufyan wanted to go in for the kill. And so Imam Ali says, there was a Pain in my eye. You see, if a small hair goes in our eyes, how many times you go to the bathroom, hot water, then your cousin says warm water, then someone says throw this into your eye. Baba, just tell me, how do I get that hair out of my eye? Each of you is giving me an experiment for science. I just want to hear a small hair. Imam Ali says, that khalafa, pain in my eye, suffocation in my throat. But when he saw this happen, question arises. What did he think of those who did it? I said to you the sermon of Shakshaqiyya. He blatantly says what he thinks of them. But there's an amazing hadith in Sahih Muslim. You have to look at this hadith. It's unbelievable. It's, it's, it's actually it's crazy. This hadith is just unreal. Now we're talking Bukhari and Muslim are famous texts. Sahih Muslim, Muslim bin Hajjaj and Nisapuri, the famous Persian scholar, he wrote the book Sahih Muslim, compiled Sahih Muslim. In Sahih Muslim, I want everybody at home to look at this incident. Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet and Imam Ali, go with Imam Ali to Umar. Abbas is claiming inheritance from Imam Ali. Imam Ali is claiming inheritance for who? The Prophet's daughter. Where will you find this? Sahih Muslim, everybody at home, everyone around the Shia world, every non-Shia, whoever you are, I'm going to give you the exact reference for this. Sahih Muslim. And it's in the section of Al-Jihad wa Siyar. In the door, you know, there's sometimes there's these subsections. Bab hukm al fay. Kitab al jihad wa siyar. Bab hukm al fay. The section of jihad 
and the expeditions, the battles, the discussion of the allowances, expenses, what is to be given from what's booty of war. We agree? Abbas has a claim against Imam Ali for inheritance. Imam Ali has a claim for Fatima al-Zahra. Umar bin Khattab, they've both next to Umar, and Umar looks at, Umar looks at Imam Ali alayhi salam, and he says, uh, having Umar already said that Abu Bakr said, the prophets don't leave behind inheritance. Umar said, the prophet don't, uh, Abu Bakr says that the prophet said that we don't leave behind inheritance. And then Umar looks at Imam Ali and says, and I know your opinion of him. This is in Sahih Muslim. And I know that your opinion of him, meaning Abu Bakr, meaning the one who says prophets don't leave behind inheritance, Fadak doesn't belong to Fatima, is that you believe that he is a kathib. And Khain, Ghadir, Athim. You believe he is a liar, he is a deceiver, cunning sinner. Is this a Shia book? Not Shia. It's not Shia at all. Sahih Muslims, no way Shia. Umar ibn al Khattab is telling Imam Ali, and your opinion of the first Khalifa is that, and I, everybody at home can go and read this. Because sometimes people might say to me that you Shia this, you Shia, the companions loved each other. Then why is Umar admitting that Imam Ali's opinion of the first Khalifa was that he was a lying, cunning, deceiving, and this is not my words, just in case someone might take this and say that this is your words. This is Sahih Muslim in the section of Jihad was Siyar Bab. Hukm al go tonight, I want everybody to read it. it. says, and your opinion of him is that he's a lying, deceiving, cunning sinner. When Imam Ali says all of this, then if I am somebody who's accused of having problems, then you've got to explain to me how Muslim allows for this discussion. Muslim then believes that Imam Ali alayhi salam, this is what he believed of those who took the helm at Saqifah. That what you did at Saqifah, to me, proves lie, sin, cunning, deceit. Therefore, anyone who now comes and says, but you know, our Imam never had a problem with anybody. So how do you explain that hadith? Not even in my books. If it was in my books, I say, okay, you're biased. In Sahih Muslim, Umar says to him, because of Abu Bakr's opinion on this, this is what the way you view him. Athim, Kathib, Khain, Ghadir. Therefore, Imam Ali السلام, knew very well that what took place at Saqifah would have repercussions. What's the repercussions? Let's be real. Ghadir, Imam Ali, Saqifah, Abu Bakr. In reality, Saqifah won. Abu Bakr got in. Umar got in. Uthman got in. But ultimately, the results of Ghadir only bought Muhammad al-Baqir and Ja'far al-Sadiq, Ali ibn Musa, Ali al-Hadi. Saqifa one day bought me Yazid. This is a huge point. What Saqifa did is it allowed anyone to have a chance to be president of the states. President of Medina, President of Mecca, all you needed to do was have the right backing, the right men, loyal, chance you could get in. And that's why what happened at Saqifah, the repercussions were what? Why can Muawiyah not appoint Yazid if Abu Bakr could appoint Omar? If Abu Bakr has the authority to appoint the person after him, why could Muawiyah not appoint Yazid? And that's why when Yazid came in, Yazid can easily turn around and say, after Muhammad died, all of you went to election. There weren't many people present. Therefore, when my dad chose me, there weren't many present. Here I am. What's the difference between me and you? Why are you rightly guided and I'm not? What's the criteria to be a successor? Why don't I fit into that bill? And who sets the criteria for who's the successor? 
If it's Saqifa that sets the criteria, a new one has a chance. Abdul Malik has a chance. Harun al Rashid had a chance. Mutawakkil al Abbasi had a chance. Everybody had a chance to be a leader because of Saqifa. All you needed was the right best friend, the right companion, the right backers, and enough hate of Ali ibn Abi Talib. And that's what happened. Only 50 years after the Prophet died, Yazid sat in the chair of Rasulullah. Because the Muslims said, we should choose our leaders. We should appoint. And don't say Yazid was chosen by his father and therefore it's wrong. Omar was chosen by Abu Bakr. Yazid can turn around and say, the same way you chose your friend, why can my dad not choose me? And if you felt your friend was suitable according to your logic, why can't my dad think that I'm the most Because you know there is an argument. Why is Yazid suitable? Because his dad had brought him up in a way of leader and empire. So he was the best to rule. Because now it became wishy-washy what leader is. You didn't have to be the most knowledgeable or the most muttaqi. You just had to be a diplomat par excellence who was able to talk to Romans and able to bring about extravagance. And that's what Islamic leadership became. And you know what the problem then results with that? is that you can appoint whatever governor you want. You want to appoint a drunk as a governor, you can. You want to appoint a bastard as a governor, a person who is the son of zina as a governor, you can. You want to appoint somebody who has nothing to do with Islam, you can. And that's why he didn't care. When he made Marwan governor of Medina, who's going to stop me? Even if Muhammad kicked him out, here he is, he's my governor. Saqifa opens the door for people like me to do what I want to do. And that's why he began to appoint governor after governor, saying that now I'm your leader, the same way they could do what they want, I'll do what I want as well. The same way they could go against Muhammad's orders, what makes me have to go with Hussein's orders? And that's why, who does he appoint? Here Marwan, he appoints. Utba bin Abi Sufyan, he appoints. But most crucially, who else did he appoint? Ubaidullah bin Ziyad. Because now all of a sudden, these are back in power. And all of a sudden, they begin to bring their governors. And the problem is when you bring the likes of Ibn Ziyad, they don't care who gets in their way. The principles of taqwa, gone. Ikhlas, gone. Tadayun, gone. And if it means that we have to behead, we behead whoever gets in our way. And if it means we have to roll their body in the streets of Kufa, then let their bodies go in the streets of Kufa. And if we have to chain up women, then chain up women. How did we reach a stage 50 years after the Prophet died that his family were chained up in the streets of Kufa? It's because we opened the door for anyone to become Khalifa. And that's why that chaining up in the streets of Kufa, was that the first victim? No, not at all. The first victim was weeks, months before they were chained in Kufa. There was already a cousin of Imam al Hussein being trampled on in the streets of Kufa. Yes? Muslim bin Aqil, the cousin of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, not just cousin, brother in law of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. He had gone towards that area, but the reality was, in going towards that area, there were lovers of Amir al Mu'mineen. But there was also a governor appointed by a Khalifa who felt he had every right to put whoever he wants to put in. And what was Ibn Ziyad? Ibn Ziyad was ruthless. Ibn Ziyad ensured that whoever was opposing Yazid had to be finished, had to be executed. And that's why Muslim in Aqil in one moment sees that there are many lovers of Abu Turab in Kufa. And he sees that this is an opportunity for him to be alongside all of these lovers. Then all of a sudden, one by one, they begin to desert him. And one by one, they begin to leave him until he finds himself a stranger in the land of Kufa. He finds that now the governor of Yazid has all his henchmen around him. And then can you imagine that side for Muslim bin Aqil alayhi salam? That side for Muslim bin Aqil where Muslim is alone in the streets of Kufa and while he's alone in the streets of Kufa he begins to think of a couple of things not just his own loneliness he thinks of his wife he thinks of his niece who's with Imam al Hussein alayhi salam and likewise at the same time you found that Muslim also thought another thought Aba 
Abdullah Abdullah is heading towards here. But the governor of Yazid is already in pole position here. He rested by a house. He was sitting there by that house. A lady came out of that house by the name of Tawa. When she came out of that house, she saw him. She said to him, what are you doing here? He said to her, if I can just have some water, that's all I want from you. She replied back to him by saying, very well. She went back into the house. Her daughter was outside the house. When her daughter was outside the house, her daughter began to speak to him. He began to talk back to her. The mother came out. She saw the daughter sad. She saw the daughter feeling disappointed. She said to the daughter, what did he say to you? Did he anger you? Did he say anything against you? She said, no, mother, no. She said, then why are you sad? She said, because mother, I asked you, who are you? I asked him, who are you? He said, I am a stranger in Kufa. Mother, that broke my heart when I heard it. She looked towards him. She said to him, oh man, who are you? He said, I am Muslim, son of Aqil. She said, which Aqil? He said, son of Abu Talib. She said, then you're the nephew of my Amir. Imagine that 50 years after Ghadir, there were still the Mualeen of the Amir. There were still those who held on to Ghadir, who would never let it go. She said to a Muslim, come inside, I'll try and protect you. Uh, within a few hours, the soldiers of Ibn Ziyad had surrounded the house of Tawa. Muslim bin Aqil thanked Tawa. He thanked her and he left a message with Tawa. They caught Muslim. They arrested him after he had fought them one by one. They took him to the head of the palace. Look at what Islam had become. 50 years after Rasulullah, 50 years after Saqifa, beheadings had become normal. Throwing people off palaces had become normal. Not even giving water to people when they die had become normal. Ya Rasulullah, what had happened to your religion? 50 years early on the day of Ghadir, we were seeing it go in one direction. Now we see Muslim bin Aqil on the floor in Kufa. His head on one side and his body on another. Just before he died, he called out, Assalamu alayka ya Aba Abdullah. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam was heading towards Karbala at that time. Imam at that moment, he realized the news had come to him that Muslim bin Aqil has died. Where did Imam al Hussein go? May Allah give sabr to all of you at this moment. Imam al Hussein went towards Hamida, the daughter of Muslim bin Aqil. What did Imam do? How many times does he do this, Ya Allah? What type of sabr does Aba Abdullah have? He patted the head of the daughter of Muslim bin Aqil. Hamida looked at her uncle. She said to him, Uncle, have I become an orphan? He said to her, How do you know? She said, Because when you pat the head of an orphan, when you pat the head of an orphan, the amount of hairs that you touch is light for you on the day of judgment. Imam al Hussein began to cry. He said to her, Hamida, no one thing. My sons are like your brothers, and my daughters are like your sisters. He embraced Hamida. He hugged her. All of a sudden, something happened that breaks the heart of every lover of Karbala. What happened? Sukain bin al Hussein. Sukain walked towards Hamida. She came towards her and she hugged Hamida. What did she say to her? She said to her, Hamida, don't worry, we'll be here for you. Don't worry, we'll be here to look after you. I ask all of you one by one. When the horse came back to the tent on the tenth of Muharram, who consoled Sukaina? When the horse came back without the rider who held Sukaina, I'll tell you who held her. Shimmer bin Dil Joshan slab held her. Omar bin Sa'ad's kick held her. The horses went and trampled all around her. And above that, the fire burnt her dress. When Sayyidah Zainab, Sukaina, Ruqayya, when all of them were chained, they walked through 
Kufa. When they walked through Kufa, they were being paraded in front of everybody. When they were being paraded, the ladies were looking at them. They were staring. Is that Zainab? Oh, that's Zainab. Is that Suke oh, that's Sukaina? Is that Kulsum? That's Kulsum. The man chosen at Ghadir. All his daughters were being paraded. One Saqifa, 50 years later, the victims are these ladies. Yes? They were all being paraded one by one. And then someone asked, Where's Hamid, a Muslim's girl? Who was it? It was Tawa. She had a message for Hamid. She came, she saw Hamid, the daughter of Muslim. She came, she wanted to embrace her. But then the poets say that Hamid looked towards Tawa. She said to her, Tawa, before you tell me what my father left for me, I want to ask you one thing. She said, what is it? When they threw him from the castle, did anyone hold his bones as he fell? Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Ya Allah, raise us with Muhammad and Al Muhammad. Raise us with the Imam of our time, Imam Sahib al-Asri wa zaman Ya Allah, allow us to be of those who hold on to the wilaya of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam There are many in the world who are feeling unwell, many who are facing difficulties and trials in their life with their family, with their finance, in their personal life, in their marriages, with their health. Ya Allah, let's recite all together, all of you together with the eye of the Qur'an. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Amman يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء 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 يا الله in the name of the one who was ill at Karbala Imam Zain al-Abidin عليه السلام cure all of our loved ones يا الله hasten the reappearance of our Imam Imam صاحب العصر والزمان we pray to Allah سبحانه وتعالى with the Surah al-Fatiha for all of our marhum and your marhumin, but before it, the loudest of your salawat.